Good morning, everyone. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Jason Gisban. Um, I appreciate everybody joining for our, our webinar series. Um, my position here at Flexport is a director of customs compliance, and I've been a licensed broker for the last 24 years or so in the industry for a few decades now. Uh, so wanted to share with, uh, with the community here some of the things that, that we see regarding holds and exams. And I'll let uh, my colleague, Brenda, introduce herself. Hello, I am Brenda Custer Espelita. I am the Vice President of Customs Compliance here at Flexport. Um, I, like Jason, have been in the industry for decades. I'm a licensed customs broker. Um, my career um, has always been in customs brokerage with a heavy focus on customs compliance. Um, we're happy that you joined us today. We wanted to, to give ample time at the end for a few questions, and I think we'll just begin. Great. Uh, first and foremost, we need to give a little bit of a legal disclaimer here. The uh, slides that you will see and the information that we are sharing is just that. It's informational only. It is not to be considered legal advice, and we certainly don't want you to rely on this as uh, in place of an attorney. If you need an attorney, we suggest you contact one. All right. So this... this uh webinar series that we're doing. It's a two-part series. Um, the first day, which is today, we'll talk about customs and agency holds. Um, so that's not an examination, but an actual review or hold, which can delay cargo. So we want to give you some insight on that. And then on day two, which is Thursday, we're hoping everybody can join us as well. And we'll be talking uh, in depth about customs and agency examinations. And that's when a government agency actually physically looks at the cargo. And we'll talk about uh, how that all works on Thursday. So hopefully, again, everybody uh, can join us on that as well. So first to start with uh, customs and agency holds and reviews. Um, so, so shipments can be designated with several different types of holds or reviews. Um, we're going to talk about what we believe to be the most common and what we see here at Flexport most often. Um, so what you see on the screen are the three main uh, topics there that we'll talk about and we'll have some other slides more in depth, but we start with the customs manifest hold and that is a hold that gets put on containers uh, generally for an x-ray. Um, that can be put on other things as well, but generally that's what we see it used for. And also we see that uh, mostly when there's a custom agricultural review. And again, we'll talk about those things a little bit more in depth uh, as we move ahead here. Um, so then we'll talk about the customs entry review and hold, and that's where customs is actually reviewing the data in the ACE system uh, that we send them. The ACE system is actually a customs platform that uh, does all of the processing and, and where brokers and filers uh, file entries, uh, and then that also requires a generally a soft copy of the entry documents, and again, we'll get into that. And then partner government agencies, it used to be referred to as other government agencies, uh, PGAs, we'll talk about their review and, review and hold processes, uh, specifically FDA, USDA, CPSC, and Fish and Wildlife. So where does this all start? Well, typically it starts off the manifest. Um, all modes of transportation need to file a manifest with customs. Um, it typically needs to be filed before the conveyance arrives in the US. And based on this information, a manifest hold may be placed at the master bill of lading. Um, because manifest data is run through custom system that they have developed over decades and that is called the automated targeting system. Um, what they'll look for in the automated targeting system is really not uh, privy to brokers or importers, but based on what we see as a broker, we can give you some possible hits for things in this automated targeting system. So first is obviously the commodity description. Um, if it's something that is flagged in the ATS system, you may get a manifest hold, just purely based on the description on the manifest. You may also get a manifest hold based on who the shipper is, the importer, the country of export, or even the route the cargo took to get to the US. There's another filing that needs to be filed 
prior to departure for ocean cargo, and that is called the importer security filing. It has many of the same details of a manifest, but some additional data elements. And if that security filing is filed late or not at all, you typically will see a manifest hold. Lastly, certain types of commodities um, are flagged for an agricultural risk. We have another slide and we talk about what that is, um, but there are, again, holds purely based on the manifest. When they are hit in the automated targeting system, typically a human needs to review it, but also a human can be reviewing manifest and put it on hold based on what they see on the manifest. If you get a manifest hold, typically it will result in a x-ray exam for ocean cargo. That's called also a non-intrusive exam. It's where large x-ray machines are placed on the ocean terminals and they actually drive the container through the very large x-rays. Additionally, uh, a manifest hold could result in an agriculture review. All right, so the customs entry review. This, is, uh, this happens when the filer transmits all the required entry data to customs. So when we go to make the declaration on behalf of the importers that we're filing for, um, all of that information gets transmitted through the automated broker interface. That's the interface that the brokers use to get into the ACE system, as I mentioned, the, the, that's customs uh, platform. So that information is transmitted and then we get a status from customs almost immediately, definitely less than a minute, uh, we'll get a response. And so either customs is releasing that cargo, so we'll get a release uh, and then we're done. Or if we did something wrong or the broker didn't put up some information in there, it might get a reject and then they'll fix it and send it back. Uh, and then there's the entry review. And that is basically when a response is received with entry review, you know, they're, they're looking, it's telling us that they're looking at the data and they're going to want most likely a copy of the entry package. That is the commercial documents that we submit for the customs declaration. They want that uploaded into their system. And now customs has a system called DIS. That's the document imaging system they use. And we do that upload. Um, and we will go and do that right away because most cases we know that entry review means they want to see the document. So we try to be proactive and your broker should do that uh, just so that they don't, that custom doesn't have to ask. And then you, you upload and you have to wait for them to review it. It can just be done in one uh, process there. So some of the triggers that uh, we, we hear about, and again, we don't, you know, we don't get, we're not privy to really what customs uh, looks at on their side, but we do know that the commodity uh, that comes in, if it's not likely from a country of export that would normally, you know, process or manufacture that good, that is a, a trigger in custom system. And so their system can pick those things up and that would trigger, you know, manifest or excuse me, an entry review. Um, if the values are not in line with the known parameters, so, you know, as Brenda mentioned, um, the, you know, customs is building these systems and now ACE really uh, is able to have kind of a brain and, and it's keeping this data. So when, you know, they see things that are out of the parameters that, that are generally what should be, um, then it's going to cause a review and, and customs would want to look at that. Uh, known problems with the shipper or importer, and, and I want to mention with the shipper, you know, when, when an importer is buying from a shipper, they don't always know who that shipper is selling to as well, right? So if they're selling to another buyer that's importing that same product into the U.S. and they end up with a problem, you could, as an importer who's buying from that same supplier, end up with delays because Customs is looking at those shipments because it's the same supplier. So that's something to keep in mind, and these are things you want to pay attention to and have your broker uh, pay attention to as well. So that if these, you know, if you see regular shipments from the same shipper all getting reviewed, you might want to take a look at that. And then, of course, there's random uh, reviews. Customs is a system will always do ran a certain percentage of random checks. And so we'll, we see that a lot. Um, and then basically what happens is we upload those documents, as I mentioned, then the officer will manually review those entry documents, and then they determine what the next step would be. And that would either be, of course, to release the cargo, uh, or if there's information that they're not able to get off those 
documents like the, the commercial invoice that we send them doesn't have enough detail for them to be able to make their decision, then they all send it for an examination. And again, we'll talk about that process on Thursday. So moving on to the Food and Drug Administration and their review and whole process. That's a little different because they call the review one process and the whole the separate process different from customs where it's all one. So for the FDA, basically, when we transmit our, our information to customs, as I mentioned, um, the data for FDA is also transmitted along uh, in the ABI transmission. And basically, again, we get those responses very quickly. Um, FDA has a separate targeting system um, that actually is automated and it looks at the data. And if you get a response within the first 15 minutes from the FDA, they say that that was an automated response and no human looked at it. Uh, if it's gone past 15 minutes, then generally that means that, they, that a, a review is going to be done by a specialist. And so we see that FDA review and with, they'll be looking at that data. They specifically don't want to see the documents at this point. The, the specialist is just looking at the data and they need one to three days to do that. So um, it doesn't help for a broker to be calling um, every day. It, you know, we, really we should call and, and follow up. Um, but if, if it's been less than three days, we just need to be careful of how often we're doing that because that would just slow the process. Um, it really has a lot to do with the, the FDA's workload. So we want to be cognizant of that. Um, so that's what happens. Now, if the FDA decides that the data is not enough, then they'll move the, well, either they'll release it, of course, if there is enough, and then if there's not, then they'll move that status to what they call FDA whole. That's a completely different status that we would get in our system. And of course, that status would show uh, for Flexport on our, our client's dashboard. So you should be able to see that uh, if your broker can give you that visibility. And that whole means they want to see the documents. So we have to upload a soft copy of the entry documents. And that's done through a completely separate system. So the FDA communicates with the public through their system called ITAX. And that's the Import Trade Auxiliary Communication System. And you can see I gave you a link there to that system. That system is public. So anybody can go to that system and look up the status of an entry. You have to have the entry number. So you need to get that customs entry number from your broker. Uh, but it, you, you can easily just go into that site, put in the entry number, and do a search in, and it will tell you the status. Um, so once the shipment goes on FDA hold, the FDA wants five, up to five days to review those documents and make a determination. And that the reason for that is it goes into their compliance side of things. So they have their entry review and then they have compliance. So once it goes into hold, then the compliance people are looking at it and they need time to, to make an uh, admissibility determination. It can happen sooner than that, but generally that's what we see. Um, so once they've done that, they'll either give what's called a may proceed, and that is a release of the goods, or they'll send it out for an FDA examination. Again, we'll talk about that on Thursday. Um, that is a completely different process too from the way the customs does it. Um, so just impossible triggers here, you know, detailed information. Uh, if it's not transmitted to the FDA, then you're, you could cause a, a review or hold. And uh, the, the reason we bring this up is there are many fields still today in our system that are voluntary. So a broker can actually transmit the information to the FDA and not have to put in everything that might help the release of those goods. A lot of things now are, are mandatory, especially with medical devices, but um, some things are not. So what we say is more is better. If you can, if you have some information that's not mandatory that could go into the filing, you should put it in there. And you should be very detailed about the descriptions that you're giving the FDA so they know what it is and they can make a quicker determination. Um, so we, we highly suggest more is better. Uh, and then, of course, other possible triggers might be the shipper, uh, the importer if they've had other issues, uh, or the commodity uh, or any of those uh, together. Um, the FDA has some watch lists that are out there. Uh, one of them is referred to as an import uh, alert. And um, basically those are, we'll give you a link to that at the end here. Um, but those are basically alerts that talk about products that are immediately detained. So, you know, if, if that happens, um, you might want to check those alerts before you're, you're actually, uh, you know, importing that cargo. And then this is just a copy of the screen. This is the Import Trade Auxiliary Communication System, ITAX. 
And this is where, as I mentioned, it's public. You just put the entry number in there. You don't need anything else except for that little code uh, that you have to put in so that they know you're a human. And then you hit submit, and then it will show you the status of your entry. And I can't show you one just because it's that would be private to whoever the entry numbers are. But um, that's just how easy it is. So another agency that has an impact to you if you import goods into the United States is the Animal, Plant, and Health Inspection Service, uh, friendly called APHIS. Um, they can put items on review or hold. APHIS is a part of USDA, and they are really charged with protecting animal and plant health. What they're looking for is uh, noxious pests, which could be insects or weeds that are um, imported unknowingly, most often in wood packing materials. In 2003, President Bush created the Department of Homeland Security. And in that same move, 2,500 APHIS employees went to work for customs as agriculture specialists. So this is a little uh, different than it used to be decades ago. But what happens is these APHIS agriculture specialists that are uh, working for CBP will review either the entry data or the manifest data and determine if they need to uh, place goods on review or hold. Um, if they're in doubt or they need more information, the CBP Ag Specialist actually reach out to the uh, USDA APHIS experts. So this is a bit confusing. There are Ag Specialists on both the USDA team and the CBP team. Possible triggers for an APHIS inspection are using solid wood packing materials. If you use wood pallets or other packing materials, note that they must be treated per USDA regulations. Um, and some commodities, just on the nature of how those commodities are shipped on open pallets or pallets that are left outside prior to loading uh, in a container or on the conveyance, um, certain pests may actually crawl into that commodity, the cardboard box, um, or uh, you know, sit and hitch a ride on a large engine that's being imported. Um, so they also look at manifest for those types of commodities, um, and also from countries, sometimes even port specific. Years ago, there used to be problems with snails from Italy. Yeah, a lot of uh, heavy products that are shipped with pallets, they, you know, that those always get a, a hold because they're they're checking those pallets. And those nothing to mention too about the solid wood packing material is, you know, they need to be heat treated and they have to be marked. So they must have the marking on there. Um, that's important because the, the, that could cause a problem if there's no marking too. Cool. So let's move on to CPSC. That's the Consumer Product Safety Commission. And this uh, is a little different in the sense that they have they have a separate team um, that's referred to as the Excess Team. They're in the Office of Import Surveillance, that's the CPSC, that works closely with customs to identify and examine products that they want to look at. Of course, consumer products, that would be a danger. Um, so they work together to put the shipments on hold, but it's all done by customs um, on the entry level. So it is entry-based, so we will see a hold um, we won't always know it's CPSC, but uh, we find those things out, of course, once they, they want to look at more. But the document, documents, again, uh, or the data is reviewed. Um, we would upload documents, as mentioned in, in the custom slide, um, in the DIS system so that they can see them. And with these situations, 90% of the time, 99% of the time, the, they're going to ask for documents. So we will always upload, upload those to be proactive. Um, and then we might even have communication after that by the CPSC officer directly in the system. So they have a, the ability to, to message the broker or filer through the ABI system um, and can communicate that way. Uh, but basically that's what happens. A lot of times with these, it will go to an exam because they want to test product. If you're importing a, you know, a product that, that has uh, lead and paint or things like that, that might move into an exam. But the, obviously the possible triggers are any commodity that it has a, a danger to a consumer. So, um, you know, it could be, could be a lot of different products. Um, a lot of things they do, do uh, pay attention to are lead in toys. That was a big thing for a while. 
Uh, and then now they have a whole children's safety requirement. So there's certain certificates that are required for different types of products. And then of course, some furniture and other products that uh, could be of a hazard as well are regulated. So fish and wildlife, they're another one that's very different. Uh, they, they work completely out of uh, custom systems. So basically, that all has to happen before the customs entry submission. So Fish and Wildlife requires the goods to be cleared through their system before we even make a declaration to customs. Uh, and only specific ports are allowed for Fish and Wildlife imports. So they don't have Fish and Wildlife inspectors in every port. And you have to know those ports, and I think there's 18 of them, um, where you can actually import. Uh, they will give permits. Uh, in advance for non-approved ports, but you have to apply for that, uh, and it isn't always approved, but um, that is something you can get in advance. And then, you know, there's no specific hold designated in the A system, as I mentioned, because it is separate. Um, some of the classification, some of the harmonized tariff numbers that we see will have a flag that tell us it is fish and wildlife, so then we would be, you know, if you're a broker that doesn't know, you would you would know that that's something you need to do. Um, but a lot of those HTS codes don't have a flag. And what I'm referring to are shirts that are imported with buttons made out of shells. Well, those shells are regulated by the Fish and Wildlife, so you have to declare them. Um, and, and that tariff number is not going to tell you to do that because it's a shirt. Uh, so there's a lot of that going on, uh, but the, the broker, the filer, and the importer really should have knowledge uh, to declare these uh, so that it doesn't get misdeclared or not declared, and then you find out that there's a problem later on. Um, so basically the cargo must be held until the Fish and Wildlife releases it, and once they've done that, they, they, they you know, the Declaration of Customs can be filed. Now this can take up to one to five days because they'll basically, you know, it depends on their workload um, and whether or not they want to go look at the cargo because they will do all that on their own. Um, but the filing is done through a system called EDEX and that's Fish and Wildlife separate system. We have to uh, declare that there. The, the, the importers are required to have permits so that that's all done through the EDEX system. Uh, and there's a fee that's paid and all of that. Um, and so that's all done through EDEX. Uh, and as I mentioned, that entire process can take one to five days. So good news. The good news is if all you ended up with was a hold or a document review, you have not proceeded into an examination. And that's good. That'll save you some money and hopefully some time. The bad news is you can have multiple types of reviews and holds from various uh, agencies. For example, you might have a hold from customs and also have a hold from FDA. A manifest hold typically will take uh, one to five days depending on the port congestion. And in fact, almost all these timelines will depend on how busy um, the people are that need to do the review to proceed to either um, forward your shipment for exam or to release it. So the manifest hold, again, depending on that port congestion can take probably one to five days. An x-ray exam for ocean cargo will take um, up to three days, sometimes much longer. It really depends on how congested that terminal is for that vessel. CBP ag, one to three days from again, the time the container is unloaded from the ocean carrier. A customs entry review, you should allow one to five days for processing, depending on workloads. It's really all about how busy the people are that review data and documents at the port of entry filing. FDA entry view, I think this is where we see the biggest variance, um, but it will depend again on workloads. Expect for just entry review up to three days from that entry filing date. For an actual entry hold where we've uploaded documents to FDA's system, it takes a little longer, up to five days. In fact, they, they don't want us to even contact them until the five days have lapsed. Um, some commodities, again, just a reminder, um, end up with both a customs and another agency hold or examination. 
So. Um, what we want to cover here really to wrap this up is how do you avoid um, the black curtain? We're saying the black curtain is because you just don't know what's going on and what are some best practices. Obviously, we believe the broker should provide the importer with regular status updates to ensure the importer is fully aware of what's going on. If you as an importer are seeing repeat holds or reviews, get some more specifics from your broker. Ask for weekly reports on what those metrics and milestones are. How long is it taking to um, have your shipment come off of the hold? Um, ensure your supplier, and this is by far the number one area we think importers can improve upon, ensure your supplier is providing complete and compliant commercial invoices. The manifest are often based on the information on that commercial invoice, and the more information they can provide on that document, the better. If the manufacturer is known, if it's an FDA shipment, you need to pot, uh, file the manufacturer, put it on the commercial invoice. Ensure your broker is using the correct harmonized tariff number that you want them to use the correct country of export and value for your entries. Um, and certainly with regards to APHIS, avoid solid wood packing material. Um, and if you are not using it, state that on the bill of lading or the commercial invoice. The, <laughs> the phrase that says does not contain solid wood packing. If you use solid wood packing, make sure it is uh, treated and has the necessary stamp. Um, never ship undeclared products. Um, truly years ago, this was a problem around Christmas time when they thought it would be a nice gesture to send from shipper to importer some Christmas treats. Um, and if customs uh, did a review and thought, uh-oh, this is not t-shirts, there's a box of candy, now your t-shirts have an FDA problem. So never declare, um, ship undeclared products. And, and most importantly, in any of these situations, have open dialogue with your broker. Um, ask questions, delve into reasons for um, possible holds and reviews and seek remedies that they would recommend. Brokers have lots of experience. Um, they handle a variety of clients and can give you some tips to make your life easier. Yeah, and, and uh, keep in mind some of the, the timeframes we mentioned, uh, because if you're seeing longer timeframes than that, you should definitely be pushing your broker to give you more uh, transparency to, to what's going on. Our last slide here is just a list of resources. If you need some more information on the things that we covered here, the first one's really just an overview of cargo flow into the US. Um, next one, how to become a CTPAT participant. Um, the FDA ITAC link how to look at products that are on imp uh, FDA's import alert list, uh, overview process of the fish and wildlife, and an overview process of the CPSC. Cool. What we wanted to allow at the end was to um, have you type in your questions to the GoToWebinar box. Um, so we'll give you a couple of minutes. I think there, there already are a couple of questions there. So we'll start with um, one we can read here. So here, here's one. Um, so this says, can you send us certificates needed for toys, furnitures, furniture, children, products, et cetera? These certificates actually come from the manufacturer. So you would need to speak and reach out to them um, based on the products that that uh, you're importing. The if you look at that link that we gave uh, for the CPSC, um, you you can find some information about what is uh, you know regulated, uh, and we can help with that. But as far as the certificates themselves, those actually come from the manufacturer of the goods. Good question. Um, can we get the PowerPoint copy of this presentation? Definitely. That, that will be coming out uh, to everybody that's on this call. Um, it's you know. also posted to uh, flexport.com in a few days, along with the recording. Okay. Cool. So here's another question. Why does a manifest hold lead to intensive exam? Well, it, 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 
It doesn't always, but uh, generally it will um, for a couple reasons. So let's take uh, x-ray, right? They put a, a shipment on hold for an x-ray exam. These machines drive, they stage the container and these machines drive down and put a big x-ray arm and they x-ray the inside. And then they look at the manifest against the picture. So if they see, you know, in the manifest that it's all the same product that should be all packaged together, they would think in the container that it's going to be one lump sum. But then when they look at the picture, they see all different types of formats of, of boxes and shapes. And so then that to them is like, why does it say it's all the same, but it looks different? So that might trigger an intensive exam. So just, just similar to how when you go through airport security, you have the TSA looking at a picture of what's in your luggage. And if they don't like what they see, they want to open your luggage and check it out further. It's really the same with... Um, a manifest hold that turns into an intensive. Something is just um, piquing their interest. Um, again, as a broker, we are not privy to all the details for what causes something to go on exam. We just can share with you our experiences for what we see being a broker. Oh, we had somebody uh, tell us they really enjoyed the webinar. <laughs> Thank you, we appreciate that. <laughs> so let's see. Uh, manufacturers issue certificate on their own letterhead, kind of like self-declaration or self-certification or something else. I think the question is, is, is that okay? Yes, definitely. Um, I, it, I think it depends on what manufacturer's certificate of what. Well, that's true. Certain, certain agency requires third party, like CPSC requires third party testing. So it, it really, I don't think we have enough information to truly answer that. Yeah, if you want to update your question as something specific, um, we might be able to help. And then I think we just have time for one more question. Um, let's see here. Hold on, we just want to read through. We got quite a few. Um, let's see. So, Does filing an entry well before the arrival reduce the chance of delays in getting the cargo timely? I would say absolutely filing the entry um, before the arrival really allows um, customs and the agencies to re review that data. And, um, you know, let's just think about it. They're people, if they get backlogged, maybe it's easier to just let things go to exam rather than review the data and release it as a hold. So certainly filing ahead of time gives the agency or customs more time to look at that data. And um, we believe it does eliminate um, some exams that would come up. Not a given, but we, you know, again, from the broker's perspective. So we got a, a question here and see if I can if you have a shipment that is on cargo and part of the cargo is x-rayed, then is the cargo placed on hold as well? I think what they're what they're saying here is if you're if you have a shipment that's in a container that's consolidated um, and it's put on x-ray, yes, that's all done prior to the container being de, uh, deconsolidated. Um, so all the shipments within that container would be put on hold. And we, we talk about um, actual examinations ne this next Thursday yeah. um, in depth. So if you have questions that are more about physical examination, please join us for our webinar on Thursday. Great. We have uh, two more minutes. I think we have maybe time for one more question here. Um, so when cargo is stacked on wooden pallets, do we need to fumigate the wooden pallets? Well, for the U.S., there is no fumigation requirement anymore. The pallets themselves, if they're wood and they're made out of solid wood, they have to be marked, as, as Brenda had mentioned. Uh, so they have to be heat treated and then marked. That is the only acceptable form for import of that type of product. Um, and that's all the USDA will accept. So. When it comes to fumigation, that yes, you might want to fumigate at the origin because, she, as Brenda mentioned as well, certain pests can get onto uh, you know these these 
shipping containers or pallets. So if you're fumigating at the origin, that's killing them. So when they're here and they're dead, that's better than... Well, we hope it kills them. Well, right. <laughs> but uh, the bottom line is, yes, uh, that's the way you avoid that kind of a problem in general. So it is recommended, uh, not with all products, but definitely products where, you, where you're having to palletize them, that you fumigate at origin. But again, make sure those pallets have the right markings from the USDA at the destination. All right, I think we're out of time. Um, thank you all for joining us. Uh, we do enjoy sharing the little bit of info we have from our years of experience, and we hope you can all join us this Thursday for uh, a webinar really on the physical examination process. Thank you. Thank you.